relatively few fungal species are pathogenic. So approximately 150 species are recognized to cause disease in mammals. Oftentimes, we think of fungi as opportunistic pathogens. They're not occurring terribly commonly, and they tend not to be contagious. So it's not something that generally spreads from one individual to another. The really important exception to that are the dermatophytes. So these are both common and very contagious. It's actually probably the most commonly encountered uh, zoonotic infection. Fungi, broadly speaking, are a common cause of disease in ectotherms, so plants, insects, fish, and amphibians. Remember, they prefer to grow at low temperatures, um, and so the body temperature of endotherms is actually quite protective. And of course, we can't forget about fever. The inflammatory response that we have to the fungi is sort of doubly protective for that reason. So in mammalian species, when do we actually see disease? Well, in cases of commensal fungi, so things like candida or malassezia, we see disease in states of immunosuppression or severe perturbations to the normal uh, resident microbiota. So a person is given um, courses of antimicrobials that wipes out all of the bacteria living in and on them, and then the fungi have new ecological niches they can inhabit. For environmentally acquired organisms, so many of our dimorphic fungi like blastomyces or coccidioides, disease follows exposure to a large inoculum. And for these organisms, we tend to see particular geographic ranges. So knowing the geographic distribution of the organisms is very important to having a, a list of differential diagnoses, which is relevant for your patient and where they're living. So that's mammals, but what about cooler endotherms? And I mean cooler both in terms of body temperature and in terms of just how cool they are. I think most people who find themselves working in sciences were at one point in their lives interested in dinosaurs, and I was certainly no exception. This is me at uh, the Royal Tyrell Museum in Drumheller, Alberta, Canada, next to this dinosaur exhibit, which we had to stop at every time we passed by this museum. And I'd strongly encourage any of you who are in Western Canada or have a chance to visit to check out this museum and their fantastic collection of fossils. But what could dinosaurs possibly have to do with fungi? Well, the current theory is that dinosaurs were wiped out by this massive asteroid impact. And if you're curious, there's kind of a funny little video here um, that animates what this asteroid impact might have looked like. After that asteroid hit, we have the formation of this geological record of the event. So the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, formerly known as the KT boundary. So this person's finger is pointing at it here in this cave in the Netherlands. Um, this is a uh, layer of sediment that was rich in iridium, which we know is not common on Earth, but is more common in um, extraterrestrial bodies. So um, the asteroid. But that asteroid impact was really just the beginning. So the ensuing kind of nuclear winter that happened after that asteroid killed off all the plant life, locked out the sun, the plants all died. Um, we have evidence of sort of a large scale deforestation event at the KT, KT boundary. Um, and we know what happens to dead plants. They break down. Fungi eat them. They're cycling the nutrients that are locked up in that plant material. And dinosaurs living at the time would have suffered from a lack of plant material. So there was a complete breakdown in the food chain um, as possibly ectotherms, maybe endotherms. I think there's still some controversy about that. But they would have had an inability to bask and warm up like we oftentimes see reptiles uh, do today. And we know that our ectotherms today need to stay warm to have uh, a well-functioning immune system. And then, of course, with all these dead plants, we would have a massive plume of fungal spores. And so if we think all the way back to one of our first lectures, we know that disease happens when we have an overwhelming challenge and compromised host defenses. So this is like the epidemiological triad in history. Um, Warm-blooded animals were protected by their elevated body temperature. So whether these were early mammals or the avian lineage of dinosaurs, our ancestors were able to survive. 
Uh, birds had the added advantage of beaks, which were able to crack open seeds and nuts, which are sort of this store of nutrients in really bad times. Um, now, obviously, this is a very speculative set of statements that's just meant to get you excited about mycology. But I do think it's a compelling story and really nicely illustrates the epidemiological triad in a way that I think anyone can understand. So the host, agent, and environment. Um, this was a story that first inspired me at a conference maybe six or seven years ago when I saw a talk by Arturo Casadevall. And if anyone is interested in this hypothesis, I'd encourage you to check out his paper here in PLOS Pathogens. So as dramatic as that is, um, we know that fungal diseases are involved in some much more contemporary extinction events and threatening species. So one of the big ones that we've been uh, learning about more in North America is white nose syndrome in North American bats. This is caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans. And what you can see here is a little brown bat in a cave. Um, we have fungal mycelia all over the um, face here on his nose and also on the skin. Um, this is a disease that was actually uh, well characterized early on in the disease uh, here at the University of Saskatchewan by some former colleagues in my department. And if you're interested to learn more, I'd encourage you to check out uh, this paper from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. White nose syndrome has been marching its way west since it was first described. So it was first identified in New York State in the US in 2006. And as time went on, it moved north, south, and west. And you can see this was the distribution of white nose syndrome um, in 2016 when I first taught this course. Uh, where we're at now is there's quite a bit more of it. Uh, so it's made its way into Manitoba, it's in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and all the way into British Columbia, as well as the west coast of the United States. So in the last seven years, um, we've moved past this sort of red line here. And as it's moved west, it is decimating uh, bat populations all along the continent. A slightly older story is that of chytridiomycosis in amphibians, which is threatening these little guys on every continent where we find them. Um, this is an infection caused by uh, Batrachochytrium dendrobatidis, and it's thought to have originated with Xenopus larvus, Xenopus levis. Um, this is the African clawed frog, which is used all over the world in research, and so it's transported globally. It also happens to be relatively resistant to the fungus, and so it's a plausible uh, mechanism by which this fungus spread all over the place, although it's not yet well understood. Uh, Chytridiomycosis is threatening many vulnerable amphibian populations. And in this image here of a poison dart frog, you can see hyperkeratosis on the forelimb. More recently, we've seen snake fungal disease emerging in the United States, and it's also been identified in Canada. This is caused by Ophidiomyces ophiodicola. Snakes tend to be fairly reclusive animals, and so we don't really have a good understanding of the mortality rates or the effects of this fungus on our snake populations. They are not interested in being around people, so they're really difficult to study. Um, this disease was first documented in 2008, although if we look back at museum specimens, um, its uh, evidence of it has been found as early as the 1940s. Fungal diseases in people were really rarely encountered before the mid-20th century. And by rarely encountered, I mean other than our dermatophytes. As we started to have more and more complicated diseases, as medical sciences advanced, and we were able to treat things that previously would have been fatal and had a more severely uh, suppressed population, we had people that were susceptible to these otherwise not such pathogenic organisms. So most commonly, we now see infections in people who have really identifiable risk factors. So those who are immunosuppressed, organ transplant recipients, people with lupus, vascular disease, diabetes, um, alcoholics and IV drug users, and then also iatrogenic factors. So prolonged antimicrobials, steroids or cytotoxic therapy, as well as AIDS. Um, oral candidiasis is actually an AIDS-defining condition. 
I mentioned at the beginning that as eukaryotes, the treatment of fungal infections can be a little bit difficult because they're much more similar to us. In this table, I present sort of a high level summary of the different classes of antifungal uh, drugs that we have available to us. Um, our azoles are probably the most commonly used in, in human and veterinary medicine. Um, drugs like ketoconazole, itraconazole, voriconazole, and fluconazole. They have a spectrum of activity, including our dimorphic fungi, aspergillus, um, variably active against candida. And these drugs act by inhibiting ergosterol synthesis, so that sterile within the cell membrane. Our polyene antibiotics, so amphotericin B, um, which has an exact mechanism that isn't well characterized, is active against a wide variety of fungal pathogens. Our polyene antibiotics, uh, so nystatin, again, the exact mechanism is unknown. Its spectrum of activity is really limited to candida. Griseofolin possibly acts by interfering with cell wall synthesis um, and is active only against dermatophytes. The allylamine, so terbenafine, is another ergosterol synthesis inhibitor, and it's active against filamentous fungi, so our dermatophytes and aspergillus, as well as the dimorphic fungi. And then our newest class of antifungals, the echinocandins, of which caspofungin is uh, one example, um, is a beta 1,3 D-glucan synthesis inhibitor, so a component of the cell wall. And this is a drug that was really developed for treating otherwise resistant candida and aspergillus infections in people. Our knowledge of antifungal resistance in our fungal pathogens is not as advanced as it is in the bacterial world. Antifungal susceptibility testing is not um, standardized to the same extent, and it would certainly be very infrequently done in a veterinary context. Having said that, there are some fungal pathogens where we know resistance is increasing, and this is a really worrying trend. So the US CDC has published these infographics um, highlighting some of the key uh, resistant fungal pathogens that we need to be concerned with, azole-resistant aspergillus, and then some really nasty candida species, including candida auris, which is a multi-drug resistant organism that has really emerged in the last 10 years or so. So antifungal resistance is something that, although not yet commonly recognized in veterinary medicine, is an emerging problem and something that we do need to be cognizant of. I don't have any new terms today that haven't already been defined, but we have a couple of questions for self-assessment. <music>